All right, so uh, today I'm going to be presenting about Vraised. Uh, even though Jin Sudik is in this paper, this is not a new fancy biometric as pointed out in the previous talks. And uh, this is gonna, in this paper, I'm going to talk about uh, how to design, implement, and formally verify an architecture for remote attestation targeting uh, low end IoT devices such as sensors and actuators. So to get started with some motivation, uh, it's not hard to find in the news and also new papers being published uh, about attacks and malware infestation on IoT devices. And to a large extent, this is because the, the common techniques and, and security services that are designed for standard computers and service, service uh, are not applicable to, to this uh, landscape of devices. And within the landscape of IoT devices, perhaps, perhaps the most challenged devices to deal with are the, the low-end devices. These are, are intentionally designed for low cost, low energy, and small size. They have a few kilobytes for program and data memory. Uh, they run on single core CPUs with a few megahertz of clock frequency, simple communication interfaces. They typically run bare metal, so they can't count on uh, any security that's attained from the operating system. And examples of these devices are the ultra low energy Texas Instrument uh, MSP430 and the AVR AT Mega32. AVR AT Mega is the one that you can find uh, on the popular Arduino platforms. So, in this class of devices, preventing malware infection is hard and expensive. Uh, to run a single signature computation typically takes a couple of seconds and, and probably the entire uh, RAM of the device to execute. So, I imagine running uh, some fancy malware prevention uh, technique that you see in, in, in regular computers. So if we, we cannot prevent uh, malware infection, the next best thing we can do is to detect when malware has infected the device, and then you can take out-of-band measure, measures to, to bring the device back to a secure state. And uh, malware detection typically involves, uh, malware detection on remote devices typically involves some form of remote attestation. Remote attestation is a two-party protocol executed uh, between a trusted, more powerful verifier and a prover that uh, is potentially compromised. So in our case, the prover is this low-end IoT cyber-physical system device. And the goal is to measure the memory of the device, to figure out uh, what's, in, what's the current software state of this device. So, uh, and, and remote attestation is implemented as a, a, a simple challenge response protocol. The verifier will issue a challenge, and the prover is responsible for computing uh, an integrity ensuring function over its memory, for example, an HMAC. Right? And, uh, and then the, the, the prover will compute an HMAC on the challenge and the memory and return the response to the verifier. The verifier can check if this result corresponds to the expected memory value on the device. And all of this is too easy if you don't consider that the adversary might have full control of the, soft, the, the prover's software state. So this means that whatever memory, uh, whatever memory that is not ex explicitly per, uh, protected by uh, secure hardware, trusted hardware, uh, can be compromised. And uh, the, the typical, uh, typically in the literature you find uh, three types of remote attestation. Hardware-based typically involves a, a, a secure coprocessor or a TPM, and these techniques, they work, but they are too expensive for the kind of devices there that we are targeting here. For example, we looked up, and the cheapest TPM that we could find is itself 10 times more expensive than the microcontroller that we're trying to secure. So it doesn't really apply. On the other hand, you have software-based attestation that doesn't require any uh, software, any, any specific hardware, but software-based attestation is only secure if you have very strict assumptions on, the, on one hop and constant delay communication, which is not realistic in the IoT scenario where uh, devices speak through the internet. And on, in between the two, we ha you have a hybrid remote attestation, which is based on software and hardware co-designs. And the idea is to push as much as you can to the software side uh, in terms of implementation of cryptographic functions, and you have minimal hardware ensuring exactly what you need for those uh, uh, functions to, to run securely. And we claim that this is the best fit for, for this resource-constrained low-end devices. So before I go into what we actually did here and uh, our effort to verify a remote attestation architecture, uh, why bother formally verifying remote attestation? So first of all, for any security service, uh, formal verification promises uh, more uh, concrete guarantees about the, the, not only the, the security of the protocol, but you, it, uh, formal verification tries to push provable security to the implementation of a protocol as well. And all current remote attestation architectures, they don't have uh, 
form of verification. And uh, because they are not systematically designed from scratch, from mathematical models that allow, that allow you to reason uh, about their correctness and security, it, it means that we need to more or less uh, redesign everything from scratch, starting with these uh, abstractions. And uh, finally, uh, a very fine hybrid hardware software code design is, is hardware, as it was pointed out in the previous talk. And uh, it's also very important because we still have some hardware. So if, when, when you only have software, you can always update or patch the device. But if we still have some hardware, and if we get it wrong, you end up with trash, and you can just uh, throw your device away. So now I'm going to talk about uh, the steps that we took to verify uh, our remote attestation architecture. And uh, as a disclaimer, I have no hope of uh, going into the details of the ver verification and proof. You guys can check the paper for that. My goal here is to, to describe the methodology in general and perhaps if I have time, give you one example of how we verify one of the submodules on, on this design. So we start by defining what we want in the, our end-to-end -end goal and uh, we call it soundness and security of remote attestation. I'm going to tell you what this means in a couple of slides, but this is like what we want to achieve. And uh, to start, we need to define how the, formally define how the microcontroller works, because we're going to be uh, implementing something, something on top of that, and then we need to reason about how this implementation will inter interact what, with what is already in there. And then, uh, we, as, as I said, we have both software and hardware parts, and we're going to specify exactly what we expect from the software, exactly what we expect from the hardware, and we're going to use formal verification to uh, individually verify that the software is doing what it's supposed to do and uh, that the hardware is doing what it, it is supposed to do. And finally, we're going to use a, uh, a theorem prover to show that uh, this guarantees that we prove that are enforced by the hardware and the guarantees that are enforced by the software when applied to our device machine model imply the, our end goal of uh, sound as a security for remote attestation. So here's how we, we implement this, right? So there, there's already a couple of verified uh, Mac implementations, and uh, we rely on a verified HMAC implementation to, uh, as a software part of our, of our implementation. So basically, every, all we do in software is we have an implementation of an HMAC that has been verified to actually correspond to the cryptographic uh, specification. And then we specify everything that we expect from the hardware in some formal system called uh, linear temporal logic, which I'm going to describe in a couple of slides. And we designed this hardware as a set of finite state machines. And because we designed them as finite state machines, we can use a model checker to verify that this, each of these finite, finite state machines correspond to a given set of this uh, linear temporal logic specifications. And then we verify the hardware like that. And then finally, we use a, a, a linear temporal logic theorem prover to uh, combine with a cryptographic reduction to show that the composition of everything implies what we want. So I have one slide about the, the, the software part of this. We use a, I, I think Hackle was mentioned in the previous talk, is a verified crypt cryptographic library, and they have a verified HMAC implementation using FSTAR, and they verify it for functional correctness, meaning that what's the code that is there actually semantically corresponds to an HMAC, and also they verify memory safety and uh, secret independency. And uh, they write this in a subset of, uh, of F star called low star, and low star can out be automatically translated to C. So if we can translate it to C, we can uh, run it in, in a microcontroller. And for the hardware part, we design from scratch the hardware our ourselves. And we basically, what we basically do is that we pull out some wires, some, uh, some signals from the CPU, and uh, we state all the bad things that can happen uh, based on this uh, seven signals that we pull out from the CPU. And examples of the signals are, for example, the program counter, so we can see which uh, the address of the instruction that is being executed at a given time, and uh, the data address that tells you which memory address is being read or written. And these are examples of things that we monitor. And if something goes wrong, what we do is that we issue a reset comment immediately. So, for example, if an adversary is trying to do something that will violate the privacy of uh, the, the security of the scheme by, for example, reading the key during the execution or something like that, this will trigger a reset immediately and uh, the adversary will not succeed. So linear temporal logic. Uh, there's a lot of notation here. Don't worry. Uh, it's not very complicated. It's just a, 
an extension on, on, propos on common propositional logic where you have this junction conjunction implications. And in addition to that, you have also temporal uh, quantifiers. So it allows you to say things like, oh, if event A is happen uh, at this system state, then in the next system state, uh, event B must happen. Or event A will never happen until event B happens. And this kind of temporal statements are all we need to specify everything that uh, we expect from our hardware. So there, there's also a lot of notation here. This is just to map you back to the paper, but uh, this slide is to say that we model the soundness of remote attestation in LTL. We specify it in LTL. And essentially what it means is that if you call this uh, remote attestation software, what you get at the end of this execution is indeed uh, an HMAC of the memory and that the memory cannot change during the computation of this HMAC. Because if memory can change, then you can have like sort of clever malware that copies itself around memory to avoid detection and all sorts of attacks that have been demonstrated in the remote attestation literature. And the definition of security follows the traditional cryptographic sense uh, which is through a, a security game. And basically what we do here is that we want to have, uh, we want to prove that our design for Vraised is secure as long as the HMAC is a secure MAC. And then we make several assumptions that are necessary for us to prove, to, for us to have this cryptographic reduction. And then, uh, so this is part one, and then we have a bunch of assumptions. We state these assumptions formally in LTL, and we prove that uh, our design has every assumption that we made. And of course, we have to model also in LTL, linear temporal logic, uh, the behavior of the CPU when, for example, memory is modified, memory is read when an interrupt happens uh, to compose all those things and prove uh, what we want for, for soundness and security. And uh, what we do in this design is that we break it down as a, a set of properties that the, the remote attestation community has known for, for a while. Um, and they're ba basically of two types. There's key protection, that means that the, uh, uh, the remote attestation key, so you compute it in HMAC, so you have a symmetric key. The remote attestation key should not be, uh, should never be visible or, or accessible by untrusted, unprivileged uh, software running on the microcontroller. And the second set of properties is for safe execution, meaning that you cannot, uh, for example, learn anything uh, or, or temper with the execution of the attestation routing itself. So I'm going to go over the, so uh, and the question is, are these properties enough? So this is what we prove by using the, the LTL uh, theorem prover. We prove that these properties are enough at least to imply the soundness and security definitions that we have for remote attestation. So now a brief overview of how uh, this architecture achieves each of these properties. So the whole architecture looks like this, and we have uh, the formally verified uh, implementation of an HMAC uh, sitting in, uh, in read-only memory. Um, so this gives us functional correctness of the attestation functionality and immutability because, so immutability is necessary because it doesn't matter if you have something correct, if you can just change the instructions. If malware residing on the device can just change the instructions that are there. So this gives us these two properties. And now the rest is done by the hardware. So uh, the second question is, this the so is th does this software uh, execute properly? And the, that's enforced by the hardware, basically by uh, making sure that this uh, software will always start executing uh, from the first instruction and always finish at the last instruction, and that it cannot be interrupted by uh, any other unprivileged software. So this gives us uh, atomicity, meaning it has to execute in one pass, and controlled invocation, meaning that you cannot have uh, like execute chunks of this. You can, it has to always uh, execute the entire attestation functionality. And finally, can, can malware reside on the device, learn anything it shouldn't about the key? And it makes sure this is not possible by enforcing access control to the memory storing the key and by making sure that this attestation software always run on a separate part of the stack that's never readable to any other software uh, on the device. So this gives us all the properties we need. And uh, this is one example of how you specify and design a, a verified module for, in this case, for, for controlled invocation. So meaning that you, ca you always have to start from the first instruction and execute into the, the last instruction. And this is exactly what's stated on the, the two LTLs over there. They're basically saying uh, that if you are executing a, an instruction at an address, 
that is within the HMAC, and then in the next clock cycle you're not anymore, then this better be the last instruction, the address of the last instru instruction, or you will reset and the converse. And this is what the, the finite state machine looks like. So we do this for all properties. And at the end, we end up with a bunch of very log sub-module designs. We compose them together, and this is our hardware module. And uh, we, from the hardware module designed in Verilog, we can use an automated conversion tool to convert Verilog to a verification language called uh, SMV. And from the SMV, we can uh, use a model checker, which is called new SMV, to, to prove that the composition of this uh, state machines imply, uh, uh, conform with all of the uh, linear temporal logic specifications that we need. And this is it for the, for the hardware design. Uh, I have one slide on implementation and, and results due to the time. And uh, what I want to say is that we, we, we implemented this. We, so we used the open course, open MSP430, Verilog design for the MSP430. This is one type of low-end embedded device. And uh, it, we also evaluated. There's a lot of results in the paper that I, I'm not able to cover here. So please check our paper for more details. And we found out that the hardware overhead on top of the open MSP is of 6%. And we can uh, compute the testation of the entire pro program memory in half a second. And we also synthesized this on uh, basis three FPGA. This is a commodity FPGA. And all of our proofs, all of our hardware design, all of our software is available on GitHub. And uh, so it's, it should be easy to reproduce. And also I want to point, point out that he, if you want to reproduce this, you can get the FPGA, the hardware, for free because uh, Xilinx has a donation program. So every research uh, institution can get uh, up to five of these FPGAs for free. So it should be reproducible. Uh, and to conclude, uh, again, again, I want to leave here the, the pointer to a repo. This was a, a lot of work, a lot more than I am able to talk here. And we would be ha very happy if people were to actually use this on their research or if you want to work on attestation and other uh, services that can be built on top of attestation. We have a couple of examples of other services that can be built on top of attestation, such as uh, proofs of software update, proofs of uh, erasure, resets, uh, proof of software execution, meaning that if you have a sensor on the field and uh, that sensor is, ex uh, has, uh, there's some software that should execute to produce the output of a sensed value, you can cryptographically tie the output of the sensor to the code that, executing, that executed using attestation. And that means that you essentially can build a sensor that cannot lie, even under uh, full software compromise. So with that, uh, uh, I'll conclude, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. So are you going to replace my crappy ESP32 with something that costs a buck more and has some security in it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I wouldn't look say that, to buying one. But I wouldn't say it's, uh, the MSP430 is crappy. I mean, they, they, they emphasize it, a lo energy a, a lot, right? It and is really the best $8 yeah. CPU I've ever yeah. used. But, uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, Jeffrey Yao from UC Irvine. So really nice work. I'm wondering, um, do you have a plan to support DMA? Yes. So that's something that I, I wasn't able to, to discuss here because it's a short time. But... Uh, some of these devices, this class of devices, they don't have DMA at all. Some of them do. This, the OpenMSP430 does, and we support, and there's like a couple of, uh, you see the, in the little square there, there's like DMA enable and DMA address that tells you if DMA is accessing memory, and we check for violations done by DMA as well. Thank you. No problem. Thanks again, and thank you all for the early morning session. I think this went really well.